From the splendor of heaven to the world down below, from a manger to an old rocket tree, from the dawn of creation through the corridors of time, the Savior in love. But I resisted his touch Instead I reached for other things I thought meant so much Things of value in earth's market I had sought all of them But all the time I was seeking For him, he was seeking for me. Jesus was seeking for me. Though I knew him not, still he loved me and was seeking for me. He was seeking for me. Yes, he was seeking. For me, though I knew him not, still he loved me and was seeking for me. So I reached out to Jesus, crying, Lord, hear my plea. For I want you to have all. Oh, praise the praise Lord. The Lord. Jesus, Jesus found me when I gave him all my heart. He was seeking for me. Jesus was seeking for me. Though I knew him not, still he loved me and was seeking for me. And uh, glad to have you with us tonight uh, for all those that are in the sanctuary and for those that are tuned in tonight on this Sunday evening. And um, it is my prayer that uh, you were blessed by the Sunday morning service with uh, our Memorial Day service and our tribute to our veterans who have paid the ultimate sacrifice, but most importantly to Jesus for him paying the sacrifice of dying on that cross for us. And so I hope that it meant a lot to you and uh, I hope uh, the the few words that I had uh, were, were enough to, to bring a blessing to you and that God's Word blessed us. So um, tonight as we come together, we want to bring you a message tonight that uh, is entitled Kingdom Qualities. And um, I guess you could say that God's ways are radically different from the world's point of view or the world's ways. And so that's what we want to look at tonight. And um, so if you would... Join me with a word of prayer, and we'll ask God to bless our time together. 
Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together. We thank you, Father, for the power of your word. And Lord, I'm just leaning upon that tonight. I ask you tonight to speak through your word. I ask you, Lord, to help us to receive what you have to say to us. And Lord, I pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Lord, would move in a mighty way. Lord, I just want to tell you that I love you. I want to tell you that I honor you. I want to tell you that I praise your name, Lord. And Father, I just ask you to give your anointing tonight upon me. Help me, Lord, to lift up your name, to point people to you. And then, Lord, I pray that you would use the power of your written word, Father, to speak to us. And, Lord, that you would encourage us and strengthen us. Lord, it truly is about having the kingdom qualities in our life. And so, Lord, I ask you, Lord, to help that come alive right now. So, Father, I just want to tell you we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And, Lord, we stand in anticipation of, Lord, how you'll speak to us tonight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said tonight, we want to talk about kingdom qualities and recognizing the fact that God's way is radically different from the world's way, the world's way of doing things. And tonight's message is going to be based on a passage from the Sermon on the Mount. And you know, as I sat here and I got to thinking about that, I remember being there uh, over in Israel where uh, the sermon was, was done. That Jesus on that hillside, I can still see it. It's, uh, it's uh, very grassy and uh, the grass was obviously up pretty high there. But uh, they've got a nice tribute monument up there. And they've got different areas along uh, that you can walk where it'll have, you know, those who mourn, those who are persecuted. And it'll have those who are gentle and stuff like that. But it'll have all of those different attributes. And I can remember being there. So uh, this kind of rekindles a memory for me of getting off that bus and looking over that beautiful uh, Sea of Galilee and, and being there on that hillside where Jesus was alleged to have uh, gave the Sermon on the Mount. You know, the bottom line is this, that God blesses believers as they demonstrate kingdom qualities. God will bless each one of you tonight when you demonstrate those qualities in your lives and uh, it's these qualities that will influence the culture that is around us. It is the power of God that will change the culture that's in this church and in our community. But we have to allow the kingdom qualities come through uh, from Almighty God. So I ask, as, as all of you know, a lot of times I'll ask questions just to get you to think. But what does it mean to be blessed? When you, when you hear the word about blessed or blessed, what does it mean to be blessed? Well, it basically means happy. And uh, Jesus used it to mean to be approved of God. God's blessings, therefore, brings peace, joy, and satisfaction. So we know that when we receive the blessings of God, it does bring joy into our life. It does bring peace into our life, and it brings satisfaction. And those are three things that the world does not have. The world right now does not understand and they don't receive what we have. And so we have to have the kingdom qualities shining out through our life in order that this world may see that and yearn for those same things. And that's what my desire for all of us tonight would be. Secondly tonight, can you be happy with the things of the world? That's kind of a tricky question because we're talking about the things of the world we talked about this morning about, you know, the allurement of the world, the draw of the world. We talked about the flesh a little bit this morning. And then, of course, we talked about our old adversary, the devil. But can you be happy with the things of this world? And my answer to that is, yeah, you can be happy with it for a short period of time. I don't know how long that would be, but one cannot be blessed apart from God. You cannot truly be happy. You know, we ask the question, are you going to be happy all the time? And I can ask any one of you, and there's some wonderful ladies here today, men here today, all that love God. And if I ask you, are you always happy? And y'all have heard that before. No, there's some days when you're not happy. Some days things just don't go your way and we're not happy, but we're at peace and we have joy because we know that our faith and our trust is in God and that he provides us with that joy of knowing who we are and knowing that we have the ability to go before God and to seek his face. In this world that we live in, we deal with Pharisees. And sometimes those Pharisees are people that are very religious, people that 
want to wear their religion on their sleeve and, and uh, your mind can go to different places all over our city and county and state and all like that to think about that. But Pharisees have holiness uh, just like we desire. But the thing about it is their holiness is on the outside. It was in their garments and in their dress, the boxes that they wore on their head. They wanted to show you that they were holy. The Apostle Paul or, or Saul was a Pharisee and, and he wore his holiness at that time on the outside. But on the inside, there was sin. There was disobedience. Uh, there was being a fraud. Jesus, on the other hand, his righteousness was inside. And that's what Jesus wants for all of us today. To not be pharisaical, to not be uh, trying to look down at people and, and to try to legislate people with a lot of uh, words and, and, uh, and restrictions and things like that. But it's to be like what Jesus says and to use the power of the kingdom qualities in your life in order that you can make a, a, an issue with a lost and dying world. That people can see your life. And so we've got to be like him. So therefore, one may be blessed in a time of turmoil. Is that true? I would think so. Yes, you can be blessed when you're going through a hard time. And God, even though the turmoil is there, uh, nothing, I mean, and it could rob us of our happiness, but it can't rob us of our joy and of our peace, as long as our foundation is upon God. So, so we can go through hard times, and we all do sometimes. It could be sickness, it could be financial, it could be something uh, with your family or disobedience with your children. It could be all kinds of things, and it would rob us of our happiness, but it can't steal our joy. And uh, when we're anchored upon him. So tonight I want you if you would to look at Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to look at uh, Christ like character. And we're going to start with verse 1. And I'm going to read down through 10. And then we'll save 11 and 12 will be the final ones of uh, what we talk about. According to the, the kingdom qualities. And seeing the multitudes. He Jesus went up into the mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst, after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So tonight I want to just kind of just very quickly go through this list and and us to maybe just have enough to get a hold a little bit about what it means. And, uh, and we'll certainly move forward. But the first is the poor in spirit. Now, those who see, I believe, their need for God. I would think that the majority of us in here today recognize the fact that we're poor in spirit because we desire more of Him. We desire Christ and we recognize that we must have him in our life. And we recognize that we must draw closer to him. And to allow him to move in our life. And to help us to be what God would have us to be. We desire as I said on Wednesday message that we were talking about. That we desire to be more like him. And to draw closer and closer to him. Because the closer we get to Jesus. The farther away we are from Satan. And so that's what we have to do. So the poor in spirit. Then it says, blessed are they that mourn, 
for they shall be comforted. We realize how short of God's standards we have fallen. We were just talking about this uh, just a day or so ago when we were doing our Wednesday prayer service. But we talked about sometimes we feel so far beneath where God would have us to be. Sometimes we are in all of God's presence and knowing that He is a holy God. And when we stack up our life in front of Him and the Holy Spirit comes and checks us. And we allow Him to evaluate our life. We come up short. And we realize that we're, we're there. And we mourn over that because we desire to be close to Him. When we realize that we have fallen short of His standards. When we think about uh, Romans 6, 23. For all have sinned. Well, we think about for the wages of sin is death. So that's a very serious thing. But the gift of God is eternal life. So we thank God that He has saved us. And we mourn because we know that we're short of the glory of God. Thirdly, we want to talk about being gentle or the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This means strength under control. It doesn't mean a patsy that's pushed around. It doesn't mean somebody that has to kowtow to everything that's said. And it doesn't mean that any one of you in this room today has to be a doormat. There is a time when you dig your feet into the ground. There is a time when you stand on the truth. There is a time when it's not negotiable and that you have to take your stand. We do it in love. We try to do it according to what God would have us to do. But the thing about it is, is the word of God tells us, Jesus says, you must be meek, use meekness. So those who do not use their strength to try to dominate another but rather place their strength in Christ is what this is talking about, are called gentle. That means you got to be under control. That means that if you're going in, if, if I'm going into a meeting and I know that going in, it may be contentious or there may be questions asked. And, and I'm, just as, I'm just as human as any one of you in here. And if people push the right buttons, then it could aggravate me or get me angry or get me upset. But if I'll pray and seek the face of God and ask God, Lord, you keep my temper and you help my disposition to be Christ-like and help me, Lord, to use spiritual discernment and use wisdom as we move forward. And folks, we can handle most everything we come in, into. If we pray and ask God's presence to be there, we can do that. So it means as you face the challenges of life, you must do it with strength under control. Fourthly today, it talks about uh, blessed, are they, uh, blessed are they that are meek, for they shall inherit. Blessed are they that are hungry and thirst after righteousness. For the scripture says, Jesus says, they shall be filled. Now, the hunger and thirst is continuous. These people are aware of their shortcomings. And they don't stand on their own merits, but rather are driven to trust in Jesus' righteousness. That means that all of us today recognize, or we should be recognizing, that Lord, I can't make it apart from you. And God, for that quality to be in my life, I must pursue you and, and acknowledge you that you are the author and the finisher of my faith. You are the wind beneath my wings. You are the strength that I must have. And I must come to you with whatever troubles me or whatever uh, tasks I've been given or whatever you have that you must trust in him and thirst after his righteousness. Remember again, the more we trust in him, the more we thirst to know him, the more we draw closer to him, the farther away Satan has to be. And I like what I was told many, many years ago that when God owns the territory, Satan can't have it. That's why have you ever wondered about people with Alzheimer's? Uh, I remember in my five years at Crossroad and the many days that I was in the Alzheimer's unit, uh, it was always amazing to me to see people's minds that had been completely emptied and, uh, and really were a shell of what they once were in life. But you could sit there at a, uh, a little meeting that we would have a devotional and most of them it was hard, it, you know, it's a challenge. Like I can be preaching here and most of you right now are making eye contact with me. 
And it lets me know that you're listening or at least you're hooked in with me. But those folks are all over the place and they're falling asleep and slumping over and all that and they can't help it. And so you continue on uh, reading the Word of God and sharing a, a short snippet of a message in order that, that maybe in hopes they may somebody receive it for that brief moment. But let me tell you this. As soon as a songbook is opened up and a song is uttered off of the lips of a singer such as myself, and I don't consider myself so much a singer, but as I sing Amazing Grace to them, or we sing God is so good, or we sing the old rugged cross, or because he lives. We sing those old songs of faith, standards that we were taught years ago. There's something about those songs and the words of those songs, and I'm about to freeze to death up here, that, that reach out and touch something that is up there, and you see their mouths begin to open and be able to sing the praises of God. And as soon as the songs are over with, they go right back into their stupor. I've seen it so many times. I remember one day I was standing there in the Alzheimer's unit. I was there trying to fix to do a devotional and everybody was, you know, just, it, they're pitiful. And uh, you might have one or two that's kind of with it a little bit, but the rest of them are, are there, but uh, they really don't hear, or at least you think they don't. And on this day, there was a man there. He had gotten very ill and angry and he was pretty contentious it had changed his disposition this man for over 30 years had drove to the campground down there uh down Pis pisgah forest down that way mark you know where it's at it's where most of the campers go he had preached down there for years he had went down the crossroad and preached sunday after sunday for many years he had been a faithful minister of god's word he was a member of Crossroad Baptist Church, and I attended church with him. And he had been struck with Alzheimer's. And he had lost most all of that, and it had literally changed his disposition. And he was a mean old man now. And no telling what he might say or how he might act. And on this day, he was kind of stumbling around, and he was lost, and he was ill as a hornet. And he got to the door. And we were singing, Because He Lives. And all of a sudden, he stopped in his tracks, and he turned and he looked at me, and he should know me well, but he didn't remember my name. And he walked over there to where my little uh, stand was, and my Bible and all, and he stood there at my stand, and he says, you know, I used to do what you're doing. And I said, I know you did. And I said, you've been a blessing to me. And he said, I did this. And he said... What are you singing? And I said, because he lives like that. And we kept singing. And all of a sudden, the words came back to his mouth. And he stood there standing with his hands crossed right beside of me. Sung the song. And as soon as the song's over with, his head drops. And he walks to his room and closes the door. So for just a, a moment, God was able to take and touch something that Satan can't get. He can't take it out of your heart. Every one of you that have applied the word of God. Every one of you that have sung these songs. And we just don't sing them enough. We need to sing the old standards because they're powerful. And uh, they have meaning. I'm not saying the new songs don't have. They do have meaning. But those old songs are standards that, that, uh, that I was taught long ago that I remember hearing. And I still remember. All it takes is just to begin to sing. And all these, mess these verses come back in my mind of where we sung them years ago. And, and they're powerful. Uh, in our life. And I think all of you would agree with me on that. Then uh, we talk about the merciful. Uh, we think about those who are filled <coughs> with mercy. It said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Now, believers who recognize God's unmerited and unboundful favor to them are then able to reach out to others who have the same need. That's why you got some people that are, that are drawn to people that are down on their luck. Sometimes people will joke and pick at different ones of us. And, and Mark catches a lot. But sometimes he has a propensity to be drawn to people who are down on their luck. Who don't have a lot. Who are struggling in life. Who are looked down by many people. And yet they have a soul that's just as, value as any, valuable as anybody that's in this room. 
And they desire and God desires for them to know him just as much as somebody that has $5,000 in their pocketbook or has five cents. And so when we think about what we deserve, and you might think tonight, and, and, and I'm not trying to hammer any of you in here, but we might think tonight, well, you know, I've kind of arrived. I'm, I'm, I'm born again. I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to live a godly life. You know what God, you know what the word of God says? That our righteousness is as filthy rags. You know what those filthy rags, the image is that is given in scripture? Those filthy rags would have been rags that would be similar to what would be placed on a leper whose skin and tissue is rotting away and running and oozing. I mean, I got a nurse in here. I mean, just nastiness. And the Bible gives that image. That's what your righteousness is. is. Preacher, that's what your righteousness is. And when you think about that, it's hard to imagine. But when you go to that level and you imagine your righteousness is as filthy rags. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? There is none righteous. No, not one. And it kind of hits us where we're at. And so I remember Paul Trollinger one time telling me this verse of scripture. And that's how, this is where I committed it to memory. But it says over in Lamentations, it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions, they fail not. They're renewed every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That's in the Lamentations. I believe it's in chapter 2. And uh, I want to say it's around 40, but, but it's in there. But the thing about it is, is that when you think about that, isn't it wonderful to know that every single day, God renews his love to you. And there's nothing you can do that will change his love for you and his desire to draw close to you. So that mercifulness means that now we're inclined to reach out to those who also need mercy. Folks, that means we've got, we've got to be kind-hearted to people. We've got to be gentle. We've got to love people through their issues and their problems. And we've got to act with compassion. When, they see our, uh, sp when we see a, a spiritual or a physical need. And we have that challenge to do that. All right, then the pure in heart. When you think about the pure in heart, that clearly says, Jesus says, they shall see God. Now, how do you have a pure heart someday? As God takes the filth of this world away, we're clothed in His righteousness. That's how we can have a pure heart. We're to strive every day to live godly, you know, I think about Isaiah when he was in the temple there and the vision was that he was there and he seen God in that temple and he said, woe is me for I am a man undone, I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people with unclean lips. Folks, we have to understand that without him that we can't do it, but we can be pure in heart through the holiness of God, through this word that we don't hear much in these days and that's sanctification. We are to be saved because God provides the gift of salvation. But the word of God also tells us that we're to be sanctified. That means set apart. That means that we're to be cleansed of the very root of sin. If you, if you think about a parcel of ground for just a minute. And on that ground is old ugly gnarly trees. Which would stand for sin. And we go in and somebody a lot greater than us goes in and cuts all those trees down. But what's left is the stumps. The root of that sin. And sanctification is almost like we have the Holy Spirit, which would be like a bulldozer, would go in there and take those stumps and those roots and rip them out of that ground. And then we're filled with the Spirit of the living God. That God comes in and fills those holes that are left. So that's how I kind of always grasp it in my life. To help me to understand kind of what those three things were. Salvation is when we get the sin out of our life. Sanctification is when we have even the very root of that sin taken out. The Bible tells us, we studied this on Wednesday, that, that uh, Christ, when he came out uh, of the grave, he won the victory over the enemy, over the devil and the demons, and their power to hold us down. He broke their power and so we're able to have those sin roots taken out of our life. And then we're to pray, God, now fill me up to overflowing with the power of God. 
And so that's kind of how I've always seen that in my life. And so uh, the one who walks uprightly does right, speaks right, speaks the truth in his heart. And, um, and we lose, uh, you know, having one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. Seventhly today, uh, the one that I want to give you is the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, um, for they shall be called children of God. Now, not pacifists, but evangelists. Those who go with the good news. Those who are driven to somebody who is not born again, who, who needs help, that is struggling. And again, I make uh, mention of Mark. I'm just going just a week ago and speaking to this young man that was here, sat right there on Sunday morning. And uh, he sat right there. But the, earlier that week, he was lost and undone without Christ. His life was bound up in sin. And he was spiraling down. And God sent Mark along. And he had a divine appointment. And that day, after talking with him and sharing the word of truth, that boy said, I want Jesus in my heart. And I, he asked for Jesus to save him. Turns right around on Sunday morning and he's in that water right there. To be baptized as a testimony to all of you and also to God that I am not ashamed of you. And I thank God that you come into my heart. And he has a long road. He's got a lot to learn. He don't know half what y'all do. But he'll get there. And the Holy Spirit will reveal truth. And he'll use many of you. He'll use me and he'll use him to teach him. And to help him. So, you know, we have to understand the peacemakers are not pacifists, but evangelists. Those who share the gospel with others. That's why our job number one here is not to, to always go by a set of standard rules. And to be backed into a corner over this and that. Our job is to lead people to Christ. Our, our job is to send the gospel message out to a lost and dying world. And, and I know Bonnie would agree with that, I think, because she's been a missionary. She knows that we take the word of God to a lost and dying world. Maybe in another country, maybe here, but it is to go out. It is not just about in this room. It's got to go out these windows. So the peacemakers, God's true peace is available to all people. And then we think about those who are persecuted. Now, blessed are they when they're persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye. Now you notice now it's changed. It was they. But now it's talking directly to you. Blessed are you. When men shall revile you. And persecute you. And shall say all manner of evil. Against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So, when you think about those who are persecuted, that are living according to the kingdom qualities in the kingdom of righteousness. So, what attitude do all of you today have on these kingdom qualities? What is your attitude today that... That when you consider these things and you shine the spotlight of the Holy Spirit in your life, do you have these qualities? Now, this kicking it up to another level. These things didn't come from the preacher. It came from Jesus. And he said they're supposed to be in your life. So what is the attitude? Uh, well, first of all, think about it. What is the attitude the world has about these qualities? They don't see it like that, do they? They don't, they don't see it through the lens of being a born-again believer. They don't understand. They think that uh, strength is to burn somebody's building these days or to hurt somebody or to, to, to tear somebody apart with words, get back, pay back, to be anything but merciful, to try to stomp somebody when they're down, to knock elderly people down to the ground in the bigger cities and hurt them, to do all kinds of things to Asian Americans, to black folks. To white folks walking up behind somebody and busting them in the back of the head, knocking them down, stealing their wallets, pocketbooks. That's the world right now that we're living in. So they're not with these things. They're not thirsting after the things of God because they don't know Him. They're blinded by the God of this world. And the God of this world will not allow them 
to be able to clearly understand and receive these things. But it's not until the power of God gets a hold of one of their lives and breaks through all that filth and begins to tear away those scales that a person can sense the power of God in their heart, can, can desire to know Jesus. And just like this young man, can be born into the family of God. He's got a chance now to live a life that will be totally different. Now these things, if he were to sit in here, I believe they'd make sense to him. I'll be honest with you, when I preached Sunday, I tried to do the best I can. He was here at 11 o'clock. And I'll be honest with you, most of that message was directed for somebody just like him. It was directed for all of us. And I hope it was powerful for you because it's God's word. But most of it, I had him in mind the whole time I preached. Buddy, I hope you're listening to this because this is where you're at. This is what you're going to face. All of you know that the enemy has laid traps for you. And I don't care, Bonnie, you might be the oldest one in this room. And I say that with all respect. But you're not above Satan laying a trap for you and attacking you. As godly a woman as she is and had been in service. And I use her only as an example. We could go to the very youngest person in here or the youngest couple that's in here. All of us, including your preacher, including Dwight and Brenda, Harold that was in here. We're all susceptible to the attacks of the enemy. So therefore, we must have the kingdom qualities in our life. Now, when you think about Matthew chapter 5, we think about 1 through 10. It was wrote in third person. It's referring to they. It keeps on. If you look there, it says, blessed are the meek for they. It's talking about they. But if you look at verses 11 and 12, it changes. And it goes to second person. And that's you. Of course, first person is I. But it's talking about you. It's speaking directly. That means that we are going to face times of persecution. We're all going to face times when it's not always pleasant. It ain't always going to be like Pastor Gary gets up here or whoever would be preaching in the future. That would be here and preaching the word of God if it's Mark preaching or if it's someone else years, ago, years on. And they stand up here and preach. There's coming a day when it's going to cost us for serving Him. There's coming a day it's going to cost us for preaching the truth of God's Word. Because Satan can't stand it. And he's got in men's hearts. And I remember somebody told me that they had a vision or a dream. That I was up here preaching. I don't remember a whole lot about it. But I was up here preaching and they said... The back doors of the church busted open and men with suits came in and they came down to take me. They never grabbed hold of me, but they came down here because we were having a message, obviously, on a Sunday morning. Now, that was a vision. That was a dream. Fits right in with the future, doesn't it? So for those of you listening today, we've got to understand we must be tough. It's like it's saying there, strength under control. We've got to know where your strength lies. How did I survive all those years as a policeman? Well, I'm not a tough guy. I'm not somebody that fights all the time. I don't want to hurt nobody. But how did I survive 30 years of dealing with drug dealers, murderers, robbers, thieves, crooks? All this kind of stuff that was wanting to hurt me or someone else. How did I make it? It was by the presence and the power of God. Because that was my ministry at that time. That he was preparing me to be a Balfour. I taught, you know, the thing about my life. All of you know my life. Uh, never have been ultra wild. Never had a desire to, to always love my mom and daddy. And, and was taught to be respectful to, to my elders. Love the church. I can honestly say I felt a calling to God long before I got saved. I feel like God called me out and provided people in my life. And as I grew older, certain things began to fall into place where God was talking to me, guiding me, and helping me to get that relationship. And eventually I, I had no desire to be a policeman, but God opened the door and sent me there. And for 30 years I worked dealing with people, both good and bad, 
preparing me for these days that we live now. Preparing me for Balfour. And I don't know what that tells you about Balfour, but he prepared me for come here. I think about before I got to Balfour, God sent me to Crossroad Retirement Center. I couldn't even eat a meal there. I couldn't go into a rest home and eat a meal. And I said, God, don't send me down there because I can't look at certain things. And, make it. and God said, well, okay, we'll send you there anyway. And I was able to watch old people finish and finish well. I was able to break some of that stuff. It still, you know, bothers me a little bit, but I broke most of that and was able to go right in the lunchroom and sit down and do all that. And, and all of you know what I'm talking about. Those things can tell you. But God again was there, and now here I am. And I got to preach at a lot of places and stuff like that. Preach to them people down there, preparing me for Balfour. Preparing me for the work now and for whatever God has for me in the future as we go forward. So my life has been one where God has got me to this is what I'm supposed to do. I now feel like this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I got to be strong enough to be prepared for whatever could come. So many Christians around the world are suffering persecution for their faith. So why should you be any different? Do you think the devil wants this church to continue to reach out and minister to people? Do you think he wants us to have 275, 300, 325 people in here that are hungry for the word of God? No. He would love for this church to lose its leadership. He would love for us to leave. He would love for us to get so disgusted and disheartened that we just throw up our hands and quit. That's what he would want to do. He would love for you to get discouraged and beat down. And, and he would love for us to finally wake up one day and say, where, where did we go wrong? That's where we have to have the kingdom qualities, y'all. And we have to be ready. I could think of Abel. I could think of Noah. I could think of Moses. I can think of Daniel. Joseph. John the Baptist. And the greatest example is Jesus. They all suffered for the kingdom's sake. They all experienced hard times. And yet they stood on their faith. Now, obviously the only perfect one was Jesus. So, the last point tonight that I want us to look at is in Matthew, and it begins with verse 13 through 16. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. And neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Or on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So, so, so let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. So just quickly today. When you think about salt, and we've talked about these many times, but seasoning and preservative. It's what old times they used to preserve food. But the thing about it is that, that we need to be the salt, first of all, of this world. We need to season this world. We need the gospel, the kingdom qualities to be shown forth into people's lives. And we will be what will preserve this world until the Lord decides to take us out of here. Believers should so obey the Lord that they have a positive influence on this world being the salt and the light that God has called us to do. Now, how do we place a light, when we think about that, under a bushel basket? How do we have, a, in other words, if you have the light of Christ in your life, how do you have the light of Christ? Born again. And the Holy Spirit is placed into your heart. And that Holy Spirit shines out of your light, eyes. Sometimes we get tired. Sometimes I get tired. I don't sleep as good as I used to as I get older. And sometimes we do get tired. But it doesn't mean that the light of Jesus still can't shine off your face. That that glow that might be on your face could be from the sun. But it ought to be from the 
love of the Lord Jesus Christ is it manifests itself out from you as people are looking for that. So we don't choose whether we'll be salt or light in this world. Jesus said that citizens of his kingdom are salt and light. So how do we hide our light individually? How do we hide the light of our testimony? It could be being ashamed. Not willing to get involved. Don't want to do anything. Afraid we have to work. Taking responsibility. The more we do, the more we're responsible for. And what happens is we start taking, taking that giant bushel basket and we put it over our light to where the light can't be seen any longer. And folks, it ought not be so for us. We ought to be willing to serve and to be used. And I hope you will be like me on this. I pray that God will use me until I can't go anymore. And then he takes me home. That ought to be the desire of all of us. That ought to be Bonnie's desire. God, at my age right now, use me for the kingdom. And when I can't go anymore, then take me home. But help me to burn out for you. I think Mark and I should burn out. I don't think, will I always be a pastor? I don't think so. I think that I'll get too old to be able to do this. And I think it'll work on me. And there'll probably be a time when I'll step back. But I will never quit preaching the gospel. I will never quit ministering. If I'm decrepit and 90 years old, I'll still preach the truth. I'll still be able to testify of the truth. So we've got to be willing, all of us in our walks of life, all of you are not preachers, but you are a preacher. You're a minister. And God has placed this strategically. So salt is the inward character that influences a decaying world. And I think all of you would agree, our world is decaying. And light is our outward testimony of good works that point to God. We all know that the Word of God says you're not saved by works. It's by the grace of God. But once you get saved, then you're called to good works. You're called to work for the kingdom. You're not called just to come and sit on a pew and give it up. You're not called to say, I've did my share. Let somebody else do it. That's not how it works. There's some things that you can't do. There are a time when you have to step back because of health, age, whatever it might be. You have to step back. But you never stop radiating the light of Jesus. It may be just an encouraging word that you can give somebody. It may be experience that you've had in your life that you can share with somebody. But you never retire in your ministry for the Lord. And so that's where we're at. So I hope all of you have, have received these tonight. Kingdom qualities, just a very simple message that challenges all of us that we must have the kingdom qualities found in chapter 5 of Matthew. We could have went much deeper into this. Perhaps sometimes we will. But hopefully it will stir you enough to know that, Lord, help me to have those things that are listed. And help them to be alive in my life. And help me to be available, Lord, for whatever divine appointments you have for me. I can assure you of this, from her all the way down up there and back to here, God has divine appointments that are waiting for all of us. There's going to be somebody that God's going to direct across our path that we can make an impact for the kingdom. Will you be ready? And will the qualities of God be shown forth in your life? I challenge all of you folks today that are listening I pray that this has spoke to your heart, and, uh, and I pray that as we move forward, and like I said, I may do some more messages d dealing with kingdom qualities. We'll see. But I challenge all of you to understand what your calling is and to understand that we've been called to share the love of God with a lost and dying world. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this privilege of time that we have, Lord, to honor your name. We thank you for the power of your word. Lord, I know just for myself as I sit up here and preach, Lord, you're, you're speaking to my heart. Lord, you're challenging me. And God, I pray that you'll help me to have the kingdom qualities found that Jesus gave that we're supposed to have. Lord, I will never forget walking near where that mount was, where he gave those beatitudes. 
And Lord, I just pray that God, in my mind's eyes, I can see it even now as I stand here, that God, you would help those things to be applied to my life and that I could hear his voice telling me that this is what must be in your life. God, help me for the future. Help me, O oh Lord, as we look uh, to the future of this church. God, give me the wisdom and the direction that I need as pastor to make the right decisions and choices. God, help me, Father, to rightly discern truth from error. And Lord, help me, Father, to stand strong on the power of your word. God, speak through me. Give me spiritual discernment, Lord, and help me, Lord, to do those things that are right in your eyes. Lord, I can't do it without you, but I can through the power of God. Bless these people today. Lord, bless them also. And Lord, strengthen them and help them, God, to have the kingdom qualities in their life. Father, we just ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed being with us today here at Balfour. Uh, I hope you've received the word of God. It's our full intent to minister to you in Jesus' name. And I realize that these days that we're living in right now are trying for all of us and people are being stretched. But there is hope in the word of God. And so our promise to you is that we will continue to, to share the word and uh, pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us and help us. And so I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. And if you have any prayer concerns or if you uh, need anything further that I can do or Pastor Mark can do, please feel free to call us here at Balfour, 336-672-0074. Uh, and we'll try to return your call and set up a time that we can sit down with you and talk with you. But again, thank you for being with us here at our church. May God bless you in a rich and wonderful way.